Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Entrepreneurship Matters. My name is Alicia Wilson. I'm Vice President of Economic Development for Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Health System. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to two of the giants in the PR industry that I get to interview today, Adrian Hart Harpool and Everett Hamilton. I'm going to invite them both to come on screen. I'm going to give you their bios, but not do justice. That's why we're going to have this great conversation. And then um, we're going to get right into it. So we know that successful businesses, successful entrepreneurs are not built in a day. It takes a long-term commitment, multiple failures, a lot of grit to make it happen. And these two gentlemen are just epitomize that. Um, let me introduce you to them and give you their bios, which are quite extensive. But I will, we will get through them, but we're going to hear their story throughout um, the program today. So first, I want to introduce you to Everett Hamilton. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Octane Public Relations and Advertising. As Octane celebrates 22 years in business, huge accomplishment. It boasts a successful history of implementing strategic communication projects for the private sector and government clients. The company's theme is this where culture and action meet. This grounds all of Octane's work and inspires the teams to communicate and create in a way that responds to the individual and empowers them to act. Everett leads a team that designs, develops, and implements of all aspects of awareness and engagement and communications campaigns across the Washington DC region and nationwide. Octane has developed specialty practices that focus on their clients' attention on two key communications opportunities. First, the Octane Digital leverages the rapidly changing organic and paid digital environment to deliver breakthrough and engaging content. The second, Octane Social Equity helps clients navigate and communicate with authenticity through complex social justice, diversity, and equity conversations occurring nationally and on the global stage. I know you have been busy in the last two years. So welcome Everett, excited to get to interview you today. Thank you, Alicia. Um, and first of all, thank you to you and to your team and also John Hopkins University for um, sponsoring uh, this talk today. So I'm looking forward to it with my colleagues. Excellent, excellent. We are really looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to this all week. Um, and Adrian Harpool of Adrian Harpool Associates is our uh, second um, entrepreneur featured today. For over 20 years, Adrian has served as a trusted advisor and strategist to corporate, political, and civic leadership throughout the United States. His keen insights of the marketplace and expansive personal and professional networks have been repeatedly leveraged to provide favorable outcomes for clients in various public causes with which he is associated. Adrian co-founded 21st Century Group in 1996, which was celebrated as one of the most effective and dynamic minority-owned communication firms in the country for nearly a decade, huge. Under his leadership, the firm grew to over 20 employees and successfully launched or branded dozens of consumer products, real estate projects, and social marketing campaigns. His firm has gained a national reputation for planning and managing some of the biggest events you want to talk about. I've seen you, Adrian, all over the country. Public relations campaigns and media outreach efforts that connected with targeted minority audiences at local, regional, and national levels. Um, it is a pleasure to have you too, Adrian, on today. Glad to be here. And I recall seeing the first of these when you did this a little, it's almost two years now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I watched this and I'm so glad to see that this has continued and that people are benefiting from the uh, the information you get from folks like Everett and, and hopefully that I can share today too. Excellent, thank you. We really appreciate that. And we are already starting to get in questions. Um, so we know many people are watching on Facebook right now and some are listening on the phone. Let me tell you how you can, can participate in this conversation before I get started, because I don't think I'm going to stop when we keep going. You can put your questions in the chat. You may also put them in the chat on Facebook. I'm already seeing your questions on Facebook, as well as you may text them in to 22333, type J-H-U-W-L in the message, 
I'll get all of those questions and I will weave them into this conversation today. But I wanna start with the inspiration for both of you to become entrepreneurs. So, you know, you, you are both extremely talented, clearly um, creatives, but why entrepreneurship? Everett, I'll start with you. Well, I, I have two answers. One is a very noble one. Um, my grandmother, uh, my family's from Tuskegee, Alabama, and my grandmother was one of the first African-American owned businesses in that city. She operated a dry cleaners called Masters Dry Cleaners, and she started that in the 40s, uh, in the 1940s. Uh, and so I believe that that's part of my DNA. In addition to that, you know, um, my mother, I was raised by a single mother, and she raised a very independent uh, and curious and creative son. But I will tell you the honest truth, I think, is that um, as I was graduating from college, uh, back in, uh, uh, I, I think it's, I, I think my mouth always gets me in trouble. And so I said, it's probably better for me to be an entrepreneur than to have to be supervised by a boss. And if I disagree, I, I probably won't be the best employee from an HR perspective. So I said, it's probably better for me to go into business for myself. And so I really leaned into that independent creative side uh, started my first company and then merged and started Octane 22 years ago. Wow, wow, wow. But it's also great because we get to hear, I get to hear from so many entrepreneurs that have a grandmother, an aunt, an uncle that really modeled entrepreneurship for them. And, you know, years later, they're taking yeah. up the, the charge. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as it says, it, it takes a village to raise a family. It also takes a village to raise an entrepreneur. Uh, so we have uh, family that support us. We have friends that support us. And part of our job is always to build relationships and networks. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes that's for new business. Other times it's for encouragement and support. Uh, and then other times, as you know, Adrian and I have talked about, is to develop those mutual relationships that uh, serve not only our companies, but the clients and the communities that we're out there serving every day. No, so great. So such a great, such great points. Adrian, how about you? How, what gave you the book? What made you say, I want to become an entrepreneur? I started really early. And I think, um, you know, like Everett, I had family members. We had what might be affectionately called side hustles that made monies. And as, and as, 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 in addition to whatever regular job they had, they always had something else going on, whether it was house painting or uh, I had an aunt that took in laundry and that kind of stuff. So, so you know, I, I saw a lot of that. And I think I started early with, you know, lawn mowing and all kinds of things that I could do as a young man that, you know, offered me an opportunity to, to generate income. And as I came out of college, began to look at the workforce and the opportunities. And Everett and I talked about this briefly before, there was so many, so few of us in the space mm -hmm. that this PR advertising space. Mm -hmm. um, my first connection with public relations was a, 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 a friend of mine who a couple of years ahead of me in high school who graduated and married Bubba's, and I'll use that term because a lot of us know who that is, uh, Bubba's daughter. Bubba uh, Smith? No, Bubba from the... Uh, so this is a uh, Gladys Knight's. Oh, Gladys Knight's brother. Oh, yeah, brother. right. Oh. And so he he married him. And, and back in those days, you know, like, and they did this a lot. Athletes did this a lot. You want to give somebody in the family a job, mm -hmm. right? But they don't have particular skills or whatever. So they gave them the. He came back from college with the PR, <laughs> as a with a card that said public relations, and he was someone I admired. I said, "Well, I'm gonna be like him." And so as I learned a little bit more about that. Um, it really was a path that I decided to take. And similar to Everett's experience, you know, I I didn't fit well, you know, as a round, uh, as a round figure in a, in a, in a square hole. Mm -hmm. and, and I worked in a lot of different environments. And I think I always made contributions, but I didn't feel as though they were appreciated to the extent that they could be and just saw sought to try to find my own way. Yeah. So we, let me ask this question as it's already started to come in, which is, um how did you how did you go about starting your business so there are many people on watching and they see you two like as like at the height of the game you're at the height of your industry but how did you start out 
building your business? What were the steps you went through? And I'll start with you, Everett, and then Adrian. Well, first of all, um, part of what we talk about at Octane is everybody has a story. And our job as communicators is to uh, reflect that story, connect to that story. And so, uh, you know, what I would say is the first thing you have to do is plunge right in. Uh, there is never a good time or bad time to become an entrepreneur. I think the best time is always right now. And sometimes, you know, we spend a lot of time pulling together perfect plans and perfect financing and perfect brochures. And uh, to be an entrepreneur, um, you have to have a thirst and a want to make a contribution. And then you just have to sort of cross your fingers, you know, believe in that spiritual being that guides you. For me, it's God. Um, and, and really to jump right in. And once you jump right in, uh, it takes a lot of courage to do that. Uh, it is amazing how things will start to appear before you. Now, having said that, there are still some important things that you have to do. At some point, you do have to have a plan. At some point, you do have to fo have a focus. At some point, you do have to get out there and to build your network um, and to start to attract new business. But I really think that first step is to not to, to stop thinking about it and stop wishing about it and to jump right in and get started. Yeah, really good points you talked about, just like plunging in. Never, I love what you said. There's never the best time and never the worst time to do it. The time is now. Um, such great recommendations for those watching. How about you, Adrian? What, 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 how did you think about and what advice would you give to starting out? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, Nike made millions and, you know, is one of the most notable brands in the world. Um, and while we don't use a uh, refer to their slogan much anymore, but to just do it. And I, I saw this morning in the meditation that I got from somebody and I passed on to others. Uh, it had Barack Obama's image and which got my attention, but it said that uh, 20 minutes of doing beats two, 20 hours of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes people do, uh, you know, in a game of basketball, you can dribble and dribble and dribble and some people will just spend all their time dribbling and never shoot. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you got to take the shot. You know, you say, mm -hmm. if you think you're good at something and, and you only get good at it, as you said before, sometimes you got to fail, but you yeah. get good at it by trying. And so you have to try, you have to really go out and, and step out, as we would say, on faith. And, uh, you know, for many of us in the African American community, our whole careers, our whole lives is, is and I, I, I'm deeply ingrained in faith. So, you know, you have to have faith. And, and as Everett has alluded to, um, when you're out there, you'd be surprised how many people in the community will support, will give you an opportunity. I can mm -hmm. think of some of the folks who, who took a risk on me early. And, um, and I, you know, wasn't proven, <laughs> but, but certainly I had the, the passion and the compassion and the, uh, a seemingly good sense and nothing else, the energy, mm -hmm. and was able to convince people to give me an opportunity. And some of those I didn't always do well on, but you know, ultimately, I perfected a craft to the extent that it has sustained me these number of years. And uh, a, a bunch of folks have come through our shop. Uh, they're all over the countryside in all kinds of prominent positions in marketing. And um, and I applaud them for taking the lead. Let me, let me ask you this, because you both talked about your journey to where you are today as, you know, leaders in PR, marketing, you know, event production, all of those things. But why... Uh, someone on Facebook asked, why this industry? Like, what is it about PR and marketing that drew you to it? And, you know, everybody says like your your passions and your and your purpose and all those things have to align, but your talents align with it. So what what in what things were you really good at that made you say, you know what, PR and marketing is where where I should be building my business. Ever and then Adrian. Oh, Adrian, go ahead. Well, I just want to say, because Eric touched on it earlier, I mean, we, in essence, are storytellers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that drew me to this is that I always heard negative stories about our community, negative stories about people that I knew and heard other people tell it. And I was inspired as a young, really young person in high school, Black Enterprise, Ebony, those things, those magazines, they, they displayed images to me that yeah. were so... <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, basically what, looking at, at Essence and Black Enterprise is what made me want to be part of that life. 
<laughs> and I began to realize that, that, you know, the mainstream was not telling that story. The mainstream made us think, if you look at the mainstream now, I mean, you know, you hear about all of the, the crime in the streets and all that, it paints a picture that really is not very um, positive or encouraging or inspiring. And I wanted to have a hand in telling a different story and helping people who I knew. I started my career, my business starting with nonprofit organization. The group Build here was one of my very first clients. Morgan State University um, um, Foundation was one of my first clients. And, and the reality of it is that many people in our community, many of our organizations are not effective in telling their story, don't have the mm-hmm. resources, don't often have a communications director, a staff producing, you know. So I felt I could fill that void and help them to tell their stories. And their brands like Associated Black Charities, you know, we did their logo. It's almost been 30 years now since we rebranded them and they're still using it. But, you know, so those kinds of things, just being able to have a hand in helping others tell their story in an inspiring way is what motivated me. That's really, I mean, just that, I mean, you brought up so many things when you talk about like Essence and Jet and Ebony and all those. I mean, I remember my parents, we couldn't afford a lot of things, but we always had a subscription to all of those news outlets and they were always in front of us. So you see the diversity, which is in our community and the diversity of stories. I think that's really, really I think instructive for so many of every I saw you nodding. I know I saw yeah, you yell Jet. I mean, that was, that Andrew, was the, I mean, he really hit on it. But I think for me also is I love to talk, i.e. run my mouth, and I am nosy. Uh, <laughs> and so when you're those two things, you meet people and no matter what life they're from or what socioeconomic background, what race they're from, they have the most amazing and interesting stories if you just took the time to listen uh, to them. And so in our business, what we do is we com- convert that information um, mm-hmm. and we use it to the benefit of our clients. And so, you know, we talk about a brand that was designed 30 years ago. You don't just sit down and start to work on it. You have to go out in the community and you have to talk to and listen to, and then you translate it into a brand. And for something to have been around for 30 years really speaks to the excellence around, you know, the process that they went through. You know, the other thing is that in public relations, Things and I know we'll probably talk about this a little bit more later on. Things are always changing. Yeah. And so I, as a curious person, get to always learn and get to always share mm-hmm. what I have learned with other people. And so for me, you know, this is the industry that I that, that I've chosen and that I love to work in. Yeah, but great points both of you just made. And I and I'd love to go deep in that around. Um, and someone texted this question, like, how does branding and how does your storytelling impact imagery? So like, how do you, how do you craft as a creative the story? You know, as you talked about, like the images of Ebony, like what, what are you doing? Because everybody can't do what you do. Like there are, you all are in a unique niche space. So how does it impact culture to the extent you think it does? Everett, now go to uh, Adrian. Adrian, I was going to let you know because again, I love to talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I, I, for now, and I mean, especially today, you really have to listen and you have to look. So you have to look at what people are wearing, the way people talk, what's going on in popular culture. And then once you have that information, you sit down with a team of other creative people because I like to say that I'm always the smartest in the room because I know that I'm not the smartest in the room. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so when you surround yourself with good people, you know, we take that research and that information that we have gleaned and we sit down and we get creative and we think about how do we use that so that it has an impact, so that it connects to people. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, in today's environment, There are so many brands. There's so much information out there. The good ones are the ones that kind of make it through um, and connect to people. And so part of what we do is after we come up with these brands, then we go back out and talk to people again and say, hey, how does this look? How does this sound? Is it connecting? Is it authentic? Um, we, We see all the time brands, you know, large million, billion dollar brands that make, you know, five cent mistakes. 
uh, that if they had had Adrian and I, you know, as a part of their team, you know, they could have saved themselves a lot of money um, by not making, you know, really some of the simple mistakes. And that comes back to, again, not listening to and talking with people from a very honest, humble, and authentic perspective. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. And I think <clears throat> Everett's point, and, and it's, again, it's a challenge oftentimes, of, sometimes it's a function of budget, but there are tools available now that can allow a, a small business person, a, an entrepreneur, solopreneur, um, to still get the kind of insights that we get. So when I have the budget to do it, I've got a good relationship with a group that um, offers facilities for focus groups. We do a lot of, we really like to be able to test our messages, test our images. And, you know, sometimes the time frame won't allow that or the client's budget won't give you that. Okay? But I try to start out by saying to clients, you know, got to be careful about what I call talking to yourself because yeah. we can all be here together and we have a certain amount of knowledge about a particular subject or the issue. And so we will start spinning stuff and people come across the message they think, right? But realizing that others out there in the public are not as informed, don't have the frame of reference, don't have the background that we have on the issue or on the topic, and consequently will often miss, as, as they ever said, you know, miss the point, miss the opportunity to connect with an audience. So when possible, I try to go back out after we've developed some things and go back to one example of that is a power plant downtown. Many of you all familiar with power plant, power plant, plant live. So Cordy's company was a client of ours back in the nineties. And when they first decided they were going to do the power plant development, they came, uh, Mayor Smoke sent them up to us and, and said, we want a new brand for this building, for this development. And we went and we worked on it for about two weeks. We came back to David Cordish. Many of you all know he owns Maryland Live and all that. Yeah. We came back to David and we unveiled these boards that had the graphics. And they all said power plant in three different letter styles. And David wanted to throw us out. He's like, what are you wasting my time? I told you, because that had been the name of the development previously. Yeah. And it failed twice as a power plant. Mm -hmm. But what we went out in the community and we... We, we talked about this new development and where it was physically. And what people said was, I don't care what you call it, I'm gonna call it the power plant. <laughs> and if you ask anybody in Baltimore, if you say, where's the so-and-so-and-so and you tell them where it's located, they'll say, oh, you mean the power plant. And so Dave, um, in, a, in a fit of uh, good sense, took our advice and named that property power, power plant. And it's again, another 20 years plus, that brand has not only held up there in that site but now they have power plant live as many of you know mm -hmm. and david has six other developments around the country that are branded branded as power plant but i say to you that that came from going back out in taking the message and talking to real people yeah. and you can't you can't do that inside your boardroom or in your you know on your drafting table and then just say here it is yeah yeah that's such a good point. And I, I'd love to pivot to a question we received in the chat, which is around how you have been able to position your brands and how you've been able to build your clientele. So uh, what considerations did you make? How did you market yourself and position yourself to really have been able to be on the trajectory you're on now to be you know, decades in this industry, a known, known brands? How did you do that? Everett, I'll start with you and then Adrian. Well, I think uh, the first thing to say, and it's something that I want everybody to remember is do good work. And so when you do good work that um, meets and exceeds the expectations of your clients, answers questions for them that they don't even know that they have, uh, you really start momentum. Uh, and you would be surprised that once you start doing great work and you're getting known for doing great work, as I said, the universe opens up, but you also have to be proactive at the same time. And you have to, you have to go out, you have to establish your networks, you have to get on the phone and find out, you know, what cousin knows that secretary so you can get into that office. Uh, and so there, you know, we, we have a, a business strategy at Octane where we have set goals and objectives. And then we kind of work back to figure out, okay, here's a new market, here's a new product, here's a new approach. Uh, I think the other thing, which is the most important thing is not be so quick to tell a client what you do, but being open to listening to what they want. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And when you know what they want, it's so much easier for you to design solutions that are gonna meet their pain points. Listen, we all wanna go through life with as little pain as possible. We wanna go through life with as much success as possible. And when we find companies and we meet companies uh, that help us with that, uh, then they're so much more attractive. For me also, I think it's important that, um, and Adrian also alluded to this is, you know, we are African-American owned organizations. And what we know is that that voice from a very authentic perspective is lacking in decision-making. Um, yes. Again, we see it all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what we do is not go in and say, you know, we're black. We go in and say, listen, you really, more, you really need more diversity of thought mm -hmm. um, and action and suggestions and programming so that your decisions are better and so that you know, has a greater impact on your bottom line. So it's really about how we position ourselves when we go yeah. in and we talk to those clients. But as I said, it starts with doing good work and having that at the center of your company. And, and so I guess, true. I, so I totally true. agree. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I would make a point. He talked about the pain points. I often use an analogy when, when you go to the doctor's office, if you went to the doctor's office and were there in the waiting room, and the doctor came out and said, hi, how are you, Alicia? Here's your prescription, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then turns around and goes back in their office, right? And so without even yeah. asking you what's wrong, yeah, what the problem is, you may not be able to describe it as aptly as the doctor would diagnose <laughs> it, but they need to examine you at least. And so we start off with that whole examination process. We wanna see things from the client's eyes, understand again what their goals are, as ever said, and, what is it they want to achieve? Because otherwise you come in there talking about who you are and what you do. So I try to spend as little time as I can in a particular in initial meeting because the clients, you know, you've only got, you only got one chance to really learn about them. And then the other thing in terms of brand. So I was born with mine. Uh, and, and oddly enough, I didn't like that name, Adrian Harper. I mean, I caught hell as a kid with that name. It didn't work in a lot of ways in a lot of settings, but uh, over time, I got comfortable with it. And then um, on the first part, you mentioned early on in the first part of my career, uh, in this area, at least, I was part of a company called 21st Century Group, which I started with a woman named Paris Brown, who's now at the Baltimore Times, and Edwin Avant oh, yeah. came into the company. And then we, you know, and, and so for years, we had 21st Century Group, and we, we, we achieved a lot of good things. But one of the things to my, my partner's um, angst was is that people didn't really, we, we tried hard to promote that brand, people just didn't get it. And what they'd say is, oh yeah, you need to call Adrian and, and you know, Adrian Harpool and those guys. And, 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 my, you know, and my partners didn't, didn't know, obviously didn't like that because their name wasn't mentioned. But what I came to realize ultimately as I evolved and I moved into this new aspect of the company is that most of the people I work with were gonna call me by name anyway. So I just decided to go ahead and use the name. And I have to work hard because this is, you know, as a brand, when your brand is your name, if you screw that up, you really, you're really in trouble. Um, yeah, no. So, uh, so it's it's worked out so far, and um, and but but I think Everett's points about how we we've had to get out there and really prove prove ourselves by doing. Yeah, and and one question that came in on Facebook uh, from a, a viewer is a follow-up to what you both just said, which is how are you able to talk to real people? Like, how do you, how are you able to, you know, gain the insight? Is that through groups or is that through face-to-face, -face, door knocking? How do you, how are you able, both able to harness those real insights? Everett, um, Adrian? Well, what we do is, you know, again, depending on the client's appetite and their budget, um, but then also, at just at Octane for our, our ongoing learning, uh, we use a number of solutions uh, uh, from focus groups to polling to um, interactive uh, surveys. Uh, uh, we, for a client, um, because it was a very hard to reach population, we go door to door or community to community and just have somebody um, sit and talk or stand and talk at a bus stop uh, because you want to get information. You know, we did um, 
uh, a project on fentanyl laced um, heroin. And uh, so we had to find out from that population. And so that's mm -hmm. not a population that's gonna to respond to a poll, that's not gonna to respond to a survey. So we sent people out there in the community, uh, working with community-based organizations to have conversations, to ask questions, to give incentives, to get mm -hmm. information. Uh, and again, we take all of that and we feed that into a process so that when we start making proposals and making decisions, we really have that type of background in place uh, in order to help us. Wow. Yeah, and I, I would say the same. I mean, you know, first of all, you better be people, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, you, you, you know the, the, uh, I have ridden a light rail from time to time and I have a car and I like driving, but you know, there are points at which you really need to, you can't kind of fake that. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to get, yeah. as I say, meet them where they are. And if you lose your ability to really relate, first of all, to relate to people and interact with people, whether that's in church, whether that's in the grocery store, I'm like Everett, I'll strike up a conversation with anybody anywhere. And I'm also not going to discount someone who approaches me who, you know, may seem to have a circumstance that's different than mine or you know, you know, so, you know, I'm in, in if, for, for folks here locally, um, you know, I shop on Pennsylvania Avenue, I shop on Greenmount, I'm in and out of stores and places that some of my friends, and even where I, you know, chose to buy a house, somebody's like, oh, why would you go there? It's like, because, um, you know, that whatever I can bring to this community, I need to bring and, mm -hmm. and not try to find myself as much distance, because I've made a career as Everett has maybe to some degree, being a link to that community for yeah. others. Yeah. And so, you know, why would I, um, you know, disadvantage that community from having, you know, access to what resources I have? Or why would I want to distance myself from it and then come back like a tourist and try to, you know, try and interpret for other people, you know? So anyway. No, I think yeah. what both of you said, go ahead, Everett. No, I was just going to add something to that, Alicia. The other thing is, we have to stop making assumptions about people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, we, you know, I, I would just, you know, as Adrian was talking, it reminded me of, of a project that we did for uh, a healthcare company, and they were trying to um, motivate uh, mothers to go back for healthy baby wellness checks to work with their primary care and uh, physicians. And they thought that, you know, there was this sort of assumption that people are lazy or people are busy or people are uninterested. But what we found out is that there are multiple barriers in place from childcare, transportation, you know, not everybody has the, the resources to take off from work um, or to travel across town to a remote location. And so there are all these barriers that are in place that once we didn't make any assumptions, yeah. uh, went in and started asking the questions, you started to find out what the real answers are. You know, I always mm -hmm. start from the perspective of everybody loves themselves, loves their family, loves their community and need that extra motivation. You know, people aren't lazy, uh, not interested, not in, uh, you know, not a part of a system. Uh, there's sometimes real barriers that we have to understand. <laughs> And then we have to design in a way that really supports people. Yeah, I think it's inter so interesting through what both of you have just talked about, the depth and the breadth that you go to, to not only serve your clients, but also to serve the community through being able to provide key insights. You know, I think, you know, when we talk about like why entrepreneurs like you matter, why, you know, you get something so robust when you have Black-owned businesses like yours working um, and providing um, service to industry. I'd love to talk to you about like how rare that is. And I know we have two of you on here, um, but you are you are in rare air. There are not they're not fifty um, Everett and Adrians. And so I'd love for you to give you an opportunity. And Everett, I know you talked in the pre pre show. We could talk all day about this, but. Really, I'd love for you to talk about sort of the unique um, perspective and use contribution you bring to this industry and also talk about sort of maybe a word of encouragement. We have a 
a student, a college student on who's thinking about going into PR and have never even probably seen two Black men in the industry. So love to have you just talk about that, especially at the top of the game where you both are. Um, love to have you just give reflections on that. Everett? Oh boy, large question. Um, I think where I start with this is that what I always say, even when I'm uh, approaching a new client is, first of all, we're in business. So profit and profitability has to be at the center of everything we do. And I'm not embarrassed, not shy to talk about that. Um, mm -hmm. So as I always say, let's take that off the table because I want everybody to know that's always on the table. But I like to the convenience of taking it off the table and say that, you know, we, I'm, we are both selective, I'm sure, about the kinds of clients and the kind of causes that we take on because it has to be something that not only connects to us, but for our team members, you know, our team members also look to us for leadership and they want to be involved in causes and working with clients that are really uh, exciting. We um, are starting, and I'll talk about a little later, a cannabis practice. And one of our clients is Cureleaf, which is a national cannabis brand. And uh, I remember when Shakari Richardson was disqualified. Uh, mm -hmm. from being able to participate in the Summer Olympics because she used a legal natural substance that was legal in the state in which she used. Uh, and instead of the sports world and the community running to this young lady's defense because she had gone through something very traumatic, you know, people kind of turned on her. We were furious mm -hmm. at Octane and more important, our client Cure Leaf was furious. And so we had, um, we, we pitched and had a, uh, a, an op-ed placed in USA Today, a national publication, which talked about this is not, this young lady has a story. We need to yeah. listen to her story and we need to support her through this and not turn on her. So it's those kinds of things. When we started Octane Social Equity, it was in a response to what happened with George Floyd. And quite frankly, we were sick and tired of companies you know, doing Instagram posts and Facebook posts and, you know, we stand with Black Lives Matter, you know, th that means nothing. Yeah. We want to know, what are you doing affirmatively? I mean, programs like this that John Hopkins is doing, you know, th this is an affirmative program to be inclusive and to bring in community. And so we want to work with clients that are doing that when we talk about what their social equity response is. We're not interested in working with anybody that just wants a posting on Facebook or YouTube or, or something like that. So it's really about, you know, we, we're in our communities, we care about our communities and our entrepreneurship and our businesses are gonna reflect that. Beautifully I totally, said. Beautifully totally agree said. with that. I think, you know, um, some of those of you who've been around here a while, um, I'll say that as opposed to talking about maturity or age, <clears throat> there was a, there used to be an electronics dealer in this region called Luskins. And oh, before yeah. Best Buy and before, you know, some of these other companies got into that business, they, you know, were selling TVs and radios and stereos. And, and their slogan was uh, Luskins, the cheapest guy in town. Well, Luskins not around anymore, largely too, because <laughs> being, I don't want to be the cheapest guy in town. I'm going to just tell you like it is. That's not going to be my, my <laughs> slogan. In, that's your slogan. And you know, it's not my slogan for That's sure. Slogan. Now, now the, but the other end of that is that there will be times, uh, Alicia, when I've taken on jobs that I will do pro bono or just say for free, uh, because the people have presented a case, an opportunity, and it has, and what they're trying to do represents an impact and support to others in the community mm -hmm. who will benefit from it. And if we see that there is, if we see that our skill or whatever experience or you know i'm short short of using a word like talent because i work with a lot of talented people i don't know that i am but the point i'm you making are. is that if i see what our, our resources can be applied and will make the difference in that equation then oftentimes we'll go into it and folks will say to us you know or some of the people say oh you're not gonna make any money on that or why are you working with them well you know but by the same token there are other companies and corporations we work for who can pay our full freight and mm -hmm. they give us the flexibility to be able to do those kinds of things without being concerned that we won't have food on our table. So mm -hmm. we really are convinced that we can do well by doing good 
And yeah. we really have no reservation about, um, you know, about again, where, where the resources are there, uh, charging at an appropriate level and where the resources are oftentimes. Um, there have been some organizations I've said, um, I can't afford to do what you need me to do because it's just, it's too big of a loss, but I'll write you a check. And if you can find somebody else who would do oh, it for what you budgeted, <laughs> go on with them. And then we say, <laughs> and tell us so we can hire them to do that. Right. But, 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 some, but some of that is about, quite honestly, again, there are some other younger entrepreneurs, young individual PR professionals, you know, somebody that can write a press release who will make the calls and do the pitches and on things that, you know, we, we just don't, could not either work into our schedule or don't have time for. And, you know, I love to see those kind of people get that kind of work because um, sometimes they're one-off opportunities and that one opportunity can sometimes make, um, you know, another business uh, viable. No, I love hearing that both, both of you talk about your clients and like the range of your clients and the work that you do. And that leads to a question that was posed on Facebook, which is around, I'm gonna give you all your kudos because people are shouting you out on Facebook. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you all of those at the end. Um, but this question came in, do you, how do you go about, have you turned down, ever turned down a client? But more importantly, has there been a client or an instance or a year in business that told you, you know, this is really why I do this. This has confirmed for me, reaffirmed for me that I am on the right path, that this was, this is the work I'm supposed to be engaged in. Um, I'll start with you, Adrian, see you nodding your head and then Everett. Mm -hmm. Love to hear both of your reflections. Well, this, this last couple of years has done that. Um, uh, I've had a very personal loss um, early in the beginning of the pandemic. I'm and, so sorry. Um, you know, a family member, uh, my, 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 you know, my late wife actually was an early victim. And, and so when the community began to talk about, or we began to look at the need to get information out to do mm -hmm. what we, to, to prevent when possible, you know, more deaths or more illness, um, we certainly jumped on that opportunity. And mm -hmm. so we worked with, uh, the NACP um, that was funded by, you know, I guess I can say by Bank of America to, you know, to identify African-American owned companies who could help them develop and to build, to do masks and mm -hmm. distribute those in the community. And so we were linked to that in that scenario where we helped create, there's a, I think the slogan they still use, Mask Up Baltimore. So we, mm -hmm. you know, we developed that slogan and that brand with the NACP and enabled them to get 20 plus 30, maybe 40,000 masks done and out. And not only doing that, but also those small black businesses that produced them, you know, made money and were able to meet payroll because of having that opportunity. So that's one of those kind of instances where, you know, I'm really glad we're in that business. We also produced um, in an association with Care First and the, and some others, a, um, a two hour long, um, uh, video program that was in, that was um, uh, on Facebook about you know just trying to get people to to get the vaccine around okay. vaccine hesitancy and some of the doctors that we had on from Hopkins and other places talked about the challenges that we were facing and this whole notion about variants is really okay. very aptly explained in that video okay. that um you know, you know that was way before there was a variant but but when when it came I was able to hear listen to that again and realize how um, how important it was to have that kind of information out in the community and, and that we were able to help direct and produce and distribute that that kind of work. Yeah, no, I just wanna say so sorry for your loss. And I remember when your wife passed and I saw how much work you did, which I think honored her. So um, thank you for sharing that um, with everyone today. Um, how about you, Everett? How, um... Yeah, uh, you know, also, Adrian, my condolences and uh, that I'm sure, you know, it's it's amazing how sometimes because uh, I lost my mother three years ago um, and that was a rough year for my company because, you know, it was a year that I was helping with her care. And so I wasn't able to provide the kind of leadership and business development that I typically um, have been providing. Uh, and so that was a very difficult year. And, but I think the proudest has just been 
uh, the types of clients that we have diversified into. You know, we've done, we always like to say Washington DC is our first love. And so we do a lot of the social marketing campaigns in Washington DC. But, you know, now one of our largest clients is Pepco Holdings, which is an Exelon company. Uh, and so they are owned by uh, BG&E. Uh, BG&E is owned by Exelon uh, in Baltimore. And the diversity of work that we have an opportunity to do from diversity, equity, inclusion, to mm -hmm. corporate social responsibility, uh, to reducing energy use, um, it's, you know, it's just a very exciting time. Also the cannabis work that we're doing, uh, you know, as I say, we're take, we're bringing it out of the closet. It is now legal in so many states. Um, mm -hmm. And it is a substance that has had a negative impact on African-Americans, especially African-American men uh, in the criminal justice system. And so now we see this multi-billion dollar industry and the cannabis companies that are smart are the ones that are sort of acknowledging that and are making sure that those opportunities are there for um, African Americans and people who've been disproportionately negatively impacted by cannabis. Uh, and so that's been something really exciting and great that we've uh, had an opportunity to work on. Yeah, no, and it, um, to your point, the industry is about to change. I mean, almost every state's legalizing. And so you know, there is an opportunity to do that. Now, this question has come in about from some of our younger viewers. Um, you both are seasoned entrepreneurs. That's how they put it. Um, knowing all you know now, what advice would you give to your, your younger self about starting your business? What are, the, what are the lessons you can impart that don't have to be learned? Um, that you would, you would, if you could, you would have given to your your younger self. Ever to see you? Uh... I was gonna say, Adrian, you can go first. On that. <laughs> you know, I could, I, I could make the, I could make the call to suggest that you try to raise capital first. Um, I started. I mean, I really bootstrapped. I mean, literally. So my company started from uh, the last. And it's been 30 years now ago since I had a real a job that somebody else paid me. Uh, my last unemployment check on that from that job, I did the Jack and the Beanstalk thing. I used that money to go get a fax machine and a computer and set it up in my efficiency apartment <laughs> and set up shop. <laughs> and literally, um, you know, I started there, right? I had nothing, no capital, no investment, mm -hmm. no business plan, none of that. And I just started building from there and God is good. And, you know, I've seen all kinds of, you know, at one point we had to, you know, we in inhabited the, the whole top floor of a major office building downtown with 20 something people floating around there and, and all that. But I remember that day that I bought the fax machine. And in fact, I got it at a yard sale. So, so I'm, the point I guess I would make is, that, yeah, if you have an opportunity to, to figure out what you need to get a company started and you can do a business plan and talk to friends or family or whoever you can to invest in you. That would be great if you can do it. But yeah. back to the start where we start out with Everett and, you know, just do it though. Don't, don't sit around waiting until you amass some war chest to get going. Just go, if you, if you do what you do, just go do it, you yeah. know? And at some point if you do it right, somebody will pay you to do it and you can leverage that money into more work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's great advice. You know, I think for me, and it's something that I now make as a part of how I lead, um, is don't be afraid to have the money conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, uh, I don't know what it is in our community that we don't like to talk about money, mm -hmm. whether having it or needing it um, or knowing how much of we're worth as it relates to dollars. And so I just always remembered, uh, you know, that was either a last conversation that I would have with a perspective or would forget about having that conversation. You know, you get so caught up and, you know, because you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to talk about money because sometimes we internalize that when we talk about money, we're desperate, we're needy and all yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, and, and I will just tell you what I what I had the opportunity to do was observe, you know, you know, the majority race 
that's never yeah. challenged. That, nope. that, that's what you, and I said, you know what? I can learn from that. And so now I talk about money up front. That's the first or the second thing that I do. And I make a point of saying, I talk about money up front. When I am talking with suppliers, uh, when I talk with somebody that wants to come and work at Octane, you know, I said, let's get the money, let's get the money conversation out of the way. And the moment someone says, I have an unlimited budget or that's not important, that's usually the first person that I either try to fire or don't want to work with or don't take seriously. And so I think that would be the thing that I would say to myself is, is have the courage to have the money conversation, not in an arrogant way, you yeah. know, because you're only worth what you're worth given the number of years and your background. Uh, but, but to have that, because that also allows you to be more responsive to what their needs are. So I, I think that would be it for me, the money conversation. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't have that, you, you're in trouble because quite frankly, it's again, it's almost like if you're dating and you don't ask the person what their attitudes are about things, right? It's like, um, because, you know, you could be talking to the wrong person. I mean, no one wants to spend time with you courting them, realizing that they can't actually afford what you're going to ask for. And you yeah. don't want to waste time. I hate to say it that way, waste time, but you don't want to spend time courting a client that you that knows up front that they know that they don't have the budget that you would require to do something. So the sooner you have that conversation, because there have been there have been times and I've had to say, you know, as I said, you know, maybe it's better you find someone else and I can refer yeah. some other people to you, you know. Okay. Um, so that's always that it's ever it's right, that's critical. Have that thing up, have that conversation on the front end. So nobody's disappointed. No, that's tr so, so, so true. We've um we've received a number of different shout outs, really thanking both of you for your work in social equity, the work that you do in our, our communities, but even this, like what you just talked about the finances and how like entrepreneurs should, should um, approach the money conversation. Someone asked this question, um, how should you go about negotiating and managing deals? Don't worry, I saw your question twice, so I'm gonna get, I got, got you. So how should they, did, were there any things that you drew upon to be able to ever have that money conversation um early on or negotiate the deal did you have any well you know i just had to recognize and force myself so that's that's part of my item number one or number two that i check off the the list and so it's it's uh automatic but I, you know i think that when you when you really have that open and uh, honest two-way conversation with a potential client and and you understand what their what their at least their budget guidelines or framework is then you can start to craft solutions that they're going to need. And at some point, I don't want to say the money becomes immaterial because it's never immaterial. So again, I say, let's take the money off the table at that point. Then they really are trying to find out, can you help to solve the problems? Yeah. And so for, for at Octane, I like to focus on outcomes. I don't, you know, the creative and the, the solutions are important but they want to know how many cans of, of a beverage you're going to move off the shelf. You know, they, right. you know, they love the good look and all of that, but it has to um, be really connected to a goal and objective. And you have to be, you have to show how you can achieve that goal and objective. Cause that's what they, they care about the most, the business bottom line, when you're in business, other people care about, care about business as much as you do. Yeah. And, and our, our actual positioning statement is, shaping policy opinion relationships and outcomes so mm -hmm. it is really all about outcomes as ever said and and i'm in terms of negotiating i'll tell you what i really and, and maybe i'm jaded to some degree but and maybe there's work i'm walking away from and i don't realize it but but i start off with a conversation that really talks about people will come to you and say well how much are you going to charge to do whatever or what's your budget give me a budget for doing something so, and i try to find first of all what's the outcome you want yeah. And then what are the resources you're working with? Because you need to be straight up with me about that. You know, well, how much have you budgeted for this? What I found as an African-American owned business, there were times when I would go to a client and offer to do something for X mm -hmm. and realize later on down the line that they had paid Y to someone else. Oh, yeah. The same work. And so what I say is, you know, tell me what you work. Because you would say, can give me a, a budget. I'm like, well, you know, what's important is, depending on your budget will determine whether I'm doing a TV commercial for you or whether yeah. we're passing out flyers at the Metro. 
It's right. It's right. It's and, then, right. And, and, and I might do either one, right? But you got to tell me what you're working with. If I know what resources we have, then we'll decide on what are the best, most appropriate tools and strategies and all that and, and, and tactics for you for, to, to meet your outcome. But if they're not willing to be upfront with you about that, you're in trouble. Yeah, no, someone just said great conversation. This um, this excellent advice on how to address the money. Everett, go ahead, right ahead. I just want to say, because <laughs> Adrian has, you know, made me remember a, a point that I think we have to get across. And this goes to all of your companies that are listening. Stop trying to pay African-American women, LGBTQ, other minority, Native, First American, stop trying to pay us half of what That's you right. pay other companies. And, right. and you know, it, it's amazing um, that, you know, Adrian and I have been in business, you know, 50 years combined. Um, and we still have to go to certain clients and start proving that we can do stuff that we've both done, you know, for the last 20, 22 years. Um, th that's insulting yes. at this point because we're yep. seasoned. Um, and so I think that at the same time that our mission is to uh, improve the way we communicate and do our job, I think we're also in the business of help transforming those potential clients out there in, in, in terms of how you look at, how you respond to, and how you treat other Black and Brown uh, and minority um, uh, businesses. Because uh, you know, we, we still work into level that playing field. Yeah, no, it's that is such an important point. And um, I'm going to run out of time. I can already feel it. Um, cause this conversation has been so good. Okay, let me get one question in and then I'm going to ask two more questions and make sure everybody knows. So we have confirmed Oprah's watching. So we want to know what can individuals like Oprah, others like, like little me, others who are in companies, what, how can we do? And we're already putting all of their contact information for everyone in the chat and on Facebook, and it will be in the replay that we will have up on YouTube. So don't worry, you'll know how to get us, um, how to get in there. So Everett, how, how about that? What, um, uh, how do you, what would you say to Oprah to allow for her to understand how to help companies like yours continue to thrive um, in our community? Well, I mean, for uh, Ms. Winfrey, I think it is really for her to continue doing what she's doing. I mean, she's such an inspiration to all of us yes. uh, and, and on so many different areas. And I think probably while we admire her as a businesswoman, I think it's her, philan her philanthropy. And that's something that we are doing even at Octane. You know, we're celebrating 22 years and uh, we're talking about how we're going to celebrate this because we're 22 and 22 smart. <laughs> and I oh, said I the, first, the first thing that I said to our team is I want to know how we're going, how we're going to give money, how we're going to give resources back to the community. And that's something that she really um, started and gave a lot of visibility to that it's not just about her. It's not just about the, the great yeah. things and the talents that she has because she has them and she's earned them. But she's made it her mission to, to bring other people on. I, I got to give an octane shout out for them to go to our website because we're always looking for interns. We're always looking for new. Hold on, I, I was going, go ahead, that's one of my last questions. Um, my last and questions. so that's what I would say to Ms. Winfrey is just continue to continue to serve as the inspiration <laughs> and to do what she's doing because we're all looking at it and we're emulating it in our small way in our communities. And there are organizations, again, on philanthropy, like the Baltimore Community Lending, that does support small black and brown businesses, as well as associated black charities and others who she's already supported in some way. But those, those organizations are in a, in, a, in, in a position to leverage their resources to support our work and that of others like us. Yeah, absolutely. Both yeah. of you have, both of you are- I, I gotta oh, say yes. this quick thing, um, when you said Miss Winfrey is because one of the things that I was able to do was to um, make a significant contribution to the African American Museum in my mother's name. And so if you look at the donor wall, um, you will see my name along with my mother's name. And she was there and she was alive when the museum was dedicated. Um, and that wall is outside of the Oprah Winfrey Theater. 
Um, and so again, I think it's the, her philanthropy that is, has been so inspiring. And so um, we are inspired to give to that museum as a family and as a business. Oh, that's so beautiful. Really, really beautiful. Everybody's saying, have them back, please. That's what we're getting the comments in Facebook or to have you two come back. Um, come, we'll see how we can make that happen. Um, and people are just thanking you both for what you do. Um, it has been, we've seen that in a lot of comments on Facebook today. So, and I want to say that to both of you. Thank you for Let the me opportunity. Ask, oh, my pleasure. Let me tell people this, because I'm going to go over, but this is a good going over. Both of these gentlemen are looking for talent um, and they're looking for talent, widespread talent uh, for their companies. And when you know about a good job, you tell somebody about a good job. So Everett, tell us how they can get in contact with you and how they can sign, um, get access yeah, to those. Go to, go to octanepra.com, click on careers. Uh, we always have um, uh, entry level positions open and I believe in the power of an internship. We Ooh, pay all of our interns. We want you to get college credit, but we also pay um, all of our interns uh, because you know that's when, when I hire uh, entry level, the, one of the first things I look for is, you know, have you had some type of internship because that says that you know you have the, the types of career skills, that we're looking for. We'll help to develop that talent, uh, but an internship shows that you're really interested and ready to get to work. Yeah, over the years, we've hired probably 20 interns that we, people we brought in as interns and have, have, have come here and grown. And like I said, they're all over the countryside, marketing directors, PR director, former PR director at Under Armour was one of our interns. So yeah, we welcome uh, you all too. We, we're really excited about the energy that you all bring. And um, we're gonna put you to work though. You won't you won't be able to oh, see yes. us. And 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 if you and if you're doing social media, it's gonna be for us. It won't be on you won't be on your phone. Get That's blowing right. up your own thing, your own developing yourself as an influencer on all my on my time. But we encourage That's that and and certainly they can go to the website or hit me up on uh, LinkedIn. All right, great. I'm gonna give everybody who's listening on the phone all the websites. So for Everett, his website, Octane P R A. Dot com, his Instagram, Octane PR, Twitter, Octane underscore PR, LinkedIn, you will find Octane Public Relations and on Facebook. And for Adrian, his name, wonderful name for the website, Adrian Harpool, Facebook, the same, Adrian.Harpool5, and on Instagram, Adrian Harpool Associates. Uh, I want to thank you both. I am so sorry for running out of time. This conversation was so good. I did not keep the best track. But um, it's been an honor to get to talk to both of you. And we wish you both um, much continued success. And as we, all of our watchers, you know, use people and, and uh, employ and do business with people who do good. Um, and uh, Everett um, Octane and Adrian with Adrian Harpool Associates, you both do good. So we will, we will be in touch and, and encourage others to also um, utilize you. Thank Let you, me, God bless. Oh, my pleasure. Let me wrap up by giving a couple of um, announcements. Tune in next week. We're going to be all about finance. You'll hear from Antoine Harris and Cheryl Martin, all about finance. We're going to have a whole hour about them, two leaders in the industry. Follow us on JH Connects on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Thank you to our partners, Johns Hopkins University, Johns Hopkins Health System, Hopkins Local, the Mayor's Office of Mo Small Minority Women-Owned Business, the Warnock Foundation, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business, and Bloomberg to thank philanthropies. Thank you all, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Everett. Take thank care. you, Adrian.